In this video, we are going to look at common surgeries of the cornea. The cornea is a clear window that lets light into the front of your eye. It has several remarkable properties that we explored in the first video, namely a high degree of clarity and as a main part of the focusing system of the eye. In this video, we are going to look at two principal corneal surgeries, corneal transplant and LASIK. In order to understand how the surgeries work, we need to do a brief review of the layers of the cornea. Here we have taken a section of the cornea showing there are three layers. The epithelium provides a smooth protective surface. The stroma is the main structural layer. The endothelium, though it is only one cell layer thick, is important because it pumps extra fluid out of the cornea which keeps it clear. Through a microscope, you can see the actual cellular details. Pretty cool. With that as a basis, let's start with the medical slash surgical problems of the cornea and then finish with refractive surgery. Corneal problems that cause reduced vision fall into two categories. One is loss of clarity because of scarring or edema. The other is loss of the smoothly curved surface. Scarring would typically result from infection, like a bacterial ulcer, recurrent herpes virus, or injury. The cornea also loses clarity if there is buildup of fluid, called edema. Edema usually results when the endothelial cells are not pumping enough to keep the cornea dry. Vision can also be reduced if the smooth, regular shape of the cornea is affected. For example, some people develop a condition in which the cornea thins and bulges forward, called keratoconus. If distortion is only mild to moderate, it can often be managed by wearing a hard contact lens. If that doesn't work, there are other options, including cornea transplant, which we will get to in a moment. These examples present us with two different kinds of problems, depending on which layer is affected. The epithelium doesn't count because it is usually able to heal itself. The first problem regards the stroma. Significant scarring or too much distortion can only be remedied by replacement of the stroma. In other words, a corneal transplant. The other problem is edema, which comes when the endothelial cells do not keep up with their pumping function. The stroma is okay, it is just filled with fluid. There are two common reasons for this. One is an inherited dystrophy, and the other is injury to the cells during cataract surgery. So what needs replacing here? Not the stroma, just the endothelium. Here is a list of the leading reasons for corneal transplant from a 2004 study in the British Journal of Ophthalmology. Replacing a failed graft is the first reason. New transplants would happen because of keratoconus, Fuchs, which is the endothelial dystrophy. Pseudophagic bullus is the endothelial damage that came from usually cataract surgery. Then viral keratitis and other corneal dystrophies. So let's look at corneal transplant. Once the stroma has become scarred or significantly distorted, the only solution is to replace it. This is the standard corneal transplant. At surgery, a circular piece is cut from the center of the cornea using a tree fine, a round blade like a cookie cutter. That piece is lifted out and set aside, carefully in case something happens to the donor piece. From a clear donor cornea, a corresponding circular piece is cut, set in place, and sutured. Here, the donor is in place, held by four single cardinal stitches. Then a continuous or running suture is carried all the way around. At the end, the tension in the sutures is adjusted very carefully to make it watertight, but distort the surface as little as possible. And that is how a standard cornea transplant is done. This surgery has a high success rate, around 90% but it has a couple of downsides. Healing and optical stability take some months. 
Because the surface of the graft often ends up a bit irregular, a contact lens may be needed for best vision. Since it is foreign tissue, it can be rejected at any time. Still, this is a very successful surgery at restoring sight. Alternatively, with dysfunction of the endothelium, there is edema, but the stroma is otherwise intact. Until a few years ago, the entire cornea had to be replaced as just described. Now there is a new surgery that aims to replace just the endothelial layer. The delicacy of this procedure is hard to describe, as the endothelial cells are quite fragile. This starts with an incision through the edge of the cornea. Once inside, a shallow incision is made to harvest the defective endothelial layer, which is removed from the eye. A new endothelial layer is harvested from a donor. It is folded carefully and inserted gently into the eye. Then it is unfolded, nudged in place, and held temporarily by an air bubble. When stable, the new cells hopefully are able to pump the excess fluid out of the cornea and it clears. One disadvantage of this surgery is the high level of technical difficulty. A big advantage is that you have a structurally stable cornea, so vision recovery is much faster, and the irregular surface is avoided. Now we move to a different ballpark, namely refractive surgery, whose aim is very simple, to get rid of glasses. Sounds good. Who wouldn't want that? There are multiple ways to approach this problem. The general concept is that in myopia, or nearsightedness, the image is formed in front of the retina. In other words, it is out of focus. That could be corrected by a glasses lens that would move the image back to the retina. But if you don't want to wear glasses, that can also be corrected by making the cornea flatter, which also moves the image back to the retina relatively simple to accomplish. Hyperopia, or farsightedness, could be corrected by making the cornea steeper, but that is more difficult to accomplish. In the 1980s, a surgery called radial keratotomy, or RK, became popular for a while. It involved using a blade to make radial slits in the cornea, which had the effect of making it flatter. It could also be used to try and correct some amount of astigmatism. Surgical results were not very precise, nor were the results very stable. This fell out of use when the more precise LASIK surgery arrived. LASIK is based on using an eczema laser to reshape the cornea. Let's look at how that's done. First, the surface of the eye is anesthetized. Then a flap is created by one of two methods. Originally, this was done with a mechanical device, like a carpenter's plane, which worked reasonably well. Now, there is a laser that can be used to make a very precise cut. Either way, the flap is hinged and is folded to the side. The eczema laser is programmed to remove a specific thickness of corneal tissue, which makes a specific amount of correction. You can picture the cornea tissue as being evaporated, in this case, flattening the cornea to reduce myopia. When that is done, the flap is replaced and allowed to settle in place. That's it. Done. Given appropriate choice of cases, that is, thick enough cornea, no keratoconus, and reasonable patient expectations, for myopia, LASIK has a high success rate. For hyperopia, there is a more limited range. LASIK is a good procedure, but like all surgeries, it is not perfect nor is it free of complications. You can pause here to read the abstracts of these two studies about LASIK if you are interested. Proving that there is considerable creativity in the refractive surgery community, here are some examples of other refractive procedures. PRK is LASIK without making the flap. Intacts are ring implants inserted into the stroma of the cornea. Moving from the cornea to inside of the eye, there are lens implants that are somewhat like contact lenses, but instead of riding on the surface, they are surgically implanted inside the front of the eye. One version goes in front of the iris, and the other between the iris and the lens. Lastly, 
A change in refraction can also happen by replacing the natural lens with an artificial lens, with the power chosen to end up with the prescription you want. That is cataract surgery without waiting for the lens to become cloudy. The technology to do this procedure is very well developed. In summary, the standard cornea transplant has reached a high level of success, but there continue to be improvements. The most recent major development is the ability to transplant just the endothelium and maintain the stroma intact. Complementary to this, there is another surgery we didn't talk about in which the stroma is replaced but the endothelium is left in place, reducing chance of rejection. For keratoconus, there are several treatment strategies available. Of particular interest is a procedure that has been in the works for several years. It involves a treatment that builds cross-links between the collagen fibers, which increases the strength of the stroma and hopefully halts further thinning. And that is done without surgery. Regarding refractive surgery, we have come a long way from the blade incisions and instability of RK to the laser precision of LASIK. However, even with all that, we are still waiting for that special piece of technology that does a good job of focusing distance and near, recreating the changeable power of the lens that was lost with age. In other words, restoring what nature gave us in youth. <laughs>